was that's probably what one of my complaints in terms of like where I feel like the first movie probably did it a little bit better in terms of like the political scheming and you know the manipulation and stuff like that. I I don't feel like he was probably given much to do in the movie but again it's, it's like something what Daniel was saying earlier uh in the review is that you kind of have to approach the movie for what it's trying to tell as opposed to what you want it to be so hello everyone bonjour welcome back this is the eye of the storm podcast if you're new hello if you're if you were here last week and the week before that welcome back Hope you enjoyed today's discussion. You should enjoy today's discussion because we're going to be reviewing. You know, let me say my opinion, but we're going to be reviewing Dune Chapter Two. But before we even get into the main discussion, oh my God, I forgot to introduce my boys, Hervé and Daniel. How we doing? You going solo? Beyonce on us? Yeah, my man, my man. It's just this. Yeah, this one is going to be an interesting one because remember what I said about Dune, um, the Chapter One. How I didn't understand. Even though it was a great, it was a very good film. I didn't understand the hype behind it. So, yeah, this is my opinion now. That is going to be, well, I think it's going to be interesting. But before we even get into that, guys, what's the best recent thing you watched? Uh, I can I can go first. Main, mainly because I don't have anything great, so we just get me out of the way. Uh, mine's more reality TV, and I know we don't really do reality TV here. Uh, but I've been watching Love Is Blind, and Love Is Blind is excellent. And for those that don't understand it, it's basically you have like boys and girls, whatever, they come on the show, they're trying to find love uh, and they have to sort of communicate behind like a screen for a couple of weeks, essentially, so that they can get to know each other, sort of kind of like build connections to any other to truly figure out if love is blind. And the whole premise of it is that they have to propose to each other and get married within four weeks after coming out of the pod, basically. So they go from being in this pod where they're behind the wall, they're talking, getting to know each other, kind of falling in love to then meeting, actually, meeting in person, then having to live together, essentially, all in the build-up of the wedding. Uh, and either they get married or they get And it's brilliant. I'm on season six, season six is out now. And every time it comes out, I'm like, I'm probably done with this show. I watch it. It's great every single time. And then when they find out what the other looks like, they have to pretend to not mind. Exactly, yeah. They pretend that they don't mind or... You know what? There, there are some reactions where it's very obvious that they do mind. So, yeah, that's where it gets very interesting. That's where all, like, the drama starts and all, and all the sort of, uh, all the little interesting conflicts. Okay. Well, um, then you do, you want me, do you want to go next or do you want me to go next? I can go next. So mine is completely different. Uh, <laughs> I watched uh, Chernobyl, the HBO miniseries from a few years ago. Um, I'd heard good things about it, and they all undersold how good the show is. It's 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 five episodes and I think I watched it in two sittings. It's and I was um, was fascinated the entire time. It's 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 just incredible drama. It's it manages to be scientifically accurate, historically accurate wherever possible. Um, uh, it's acted incredibly well. It has this incredible attention to detail. So it's essentially about the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster in '86 and about the lead scientist and the party official who are basically tasked with the cleanup and everything from the accident itself all the way up to the court case where um was where where basically they find somebody to to blame um for the whole thing um that's basically covered in five episodes and it's really gruesome. I know, like, I know that that kind of pulls its punches a little bit in portraying radi- things like radiation sickness and stuff like that. But it's really, really gutting, and uh, it's, it's really heart wrenching. Um, and it really, commu- it's really like anybody who ever says that you have to dumb down a story for the audience, or you have to cut corners, or uh, kind of you, you can't portray complex things because it will lose the audience or will bore the audience. Just watch Chernobyl and tell me if you were bored. Uh, where they talk about things like dosimetry and uh, ra- and contain uh, r- radioactive containment and and things like that, because all of that techno uh, babble exposition is really riveting because it's 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 it really manages to sell you on just how how severe this crisis is and what it will take. Like there's an episode where uh, in order to build the containment structure, they have to um, clear the roof of debris of the reactor. So when the reactor exploded, it spread debris across the surrounding buildings. And in order to do that, 
they get a set of the art robot, like a German police robot from this is like 86, right? And it, the radiation fries it in about one second. And it's the most advanced piece of technology that exists in the, at that point. So they come up with a plan where they conscript hundreds and hundreds of people to work in 90 second shifts to clear the debris off that roof because anything else will just outright kill them. And if they work for less than 90 seconds, they might survive. And that scene is from the point of view of one of those workers. And the only thing you hear is his breathing and the Geiger counter that just goes absolutely crazy every time they get near the edge towards the open reactor that's spewing out this radiation. It's it's more it's the most intense thing and it's the most simple scene ever. And it's 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 wonderful. Everybody should watch it. Uh, I think you've sold me because I've, I've heard good things about it as well. But like you, I haven't I didn't watch it when it first when it came out, but I'll add it to my watch list for sure. People kind of talk about it like it's it's something you're supposed to watch as a chore, because, uh, as a responsible adult. But no, it's actually one of the best dramas I've ever seen. Um, and it manages to take its very complex and dry uh, subject matter. Um, and it, it just it just tells you what happened uh, in the most intense way possible. I think the only reason why I didn't end up watching it was because of the Chernobyl um, found footage horror movie. Because when I watched that, which I really liked, I saw that there was a series coming. I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be good. I saw the series. I was like, oh, well, what the hell is this? What's going on here? I guarantee you Chernobyl is like the, the HBO series is scarier. Well, okay, hold on. I'm going to this out there. I'm gonna have to check this out then. All right, cool. Because I saw it, obviously, you know, the IMD hate rate, IMDb rating was high as hell. Obviously, back in the day, IMDb ratings for me was a big thing, but now not so much. But yeah, so I was like, this must be good. But when I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, this is this doesn't look horror whatsoever. So yeah, but yeah, of course, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna check it out now. Cool. Thank you for putting that on my watch list. Wait, when does it start getting good? good though? Does it, would you say it gets good from after the first episode? Because I have a very from about minute two i would say that it doesn't, it doesn't stop like okay. like there's a, like, a little bit of a ramp up because like the, the accident happened like one in the morning and you know people wake up and they got got you know a firefighter gets gets woken up and gets called in and like, the first 15 minutes are kind of like because if you know what happened in chernobyl it's intense but it's not like it's it's, it's warming up for for a little bit but it wastes no waste no time there's no fat there's no filler uh it's um, you, you have to buy into the danger of it, right? You have, you, have, you have to kind of follow along with what they explain to you, why this is dangerous and why, you know, you know what the consequences of, of not containing this disaster will be. And if you do that, then it's riveting the entire way through. There's no filler, there's no, there's no waiting for it to get good. It's, it's just five episodes, like five, uh, five 40 minute episodes or something like that. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, there, there's no waiting for it to get good. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, um, I'm definitely going to check that out. For something which I think you guys should check out. I don't know if you... I think you might like it. I freaking love this. I was so surprised. But it's on Netflix it's called Wrong Side of the Tracks. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. Um, what is, what, 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 what's it about? It's a, so basically a Spanish series. I think the Spanish... So the actual one is called on the actual Spanish Netflix website was called Entravias, I think, but obviously on we've got the English one, so it's wrong side of the tracks. Pretty much a, a Spanish war veteran goes against drug dealers that try and overtake their neighborhood pretty much. And also um, his granddaughter, Vietnamese granddaughter, so she's adopted by obviously his daughter, his daughter. but I mean, his v Vietnamese granddaughter ends up falling victim to them as well. And obviously what happened to her was so dread. But yeah, this series is, I've never laughed so much, but as well as 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 well as be emotionally invested so much to the Netflix series. For me, this is definitely top five in my Netflix series of all time. This was I just found this amazing. Like the the granddad, the war veteran, he is so funny and he doesn't even mean to be. It's not one of them, it's not like one of those um immature humor type um because I don't think this is even a comedy. I, I think it's a drama. But it's more thrilling, gutsy, and yeah, it's just like a drama that has a lot of comedic humor in it, but not comedic humor that kind of overshadows the show, but like comedic humor that's executed at the right time and is mainly from the granddad and his like friendship group. 
but he's hilarious. Like he's just a grumpy old man. He's just a very grumpy old man that doesn't give a damn about nothing. Like he, like he, of course, he cares. You know, he cares about his family, but he's like one of those old men that's, you know, that he. he He's very hard, do you know what I'm saying? So then he ends up softening up throughout the episodes. I think it's three seasons. First season has to be the dreadest one of all. Like it was so sad up in and then the season three. You guys should definitely watch it. I hope he does a season four one and check uh, if he look for an update. But yeah, you guys have to watch this. It was so funny. So funny. But, and amazing. Just a drama, amazing story, amazing. Um yeah, yeah, it was it was a good one. It was a good one. All right. Well, the main event. Doing part two. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> you just see the excitement on me. Um, doing part two, Jonathan, take us away. Uh, guys, if you recall in my previous, um, our previous uh, movie review, I said I didn't understand. Well, it wasn't even a movie review. It was our previous Monday topic. It was if Dune was a good ad- adaptation. I said I didn't understand the hype behind um, Dune. I did feel, feel like it was a very good film. I just didn't understand this whole masterpiece talk that people were giving, especially with Dune 2. When I was seeing the reviews, oh, this is the best film ever made. I'm like, bro, like, what the hell? Like, I feel like a lot of people are just like, bandwagging it now. But finally watching it yesterday, Dune 2 is one... I think it might be the best, but I think it's one of the best top two sci-fi film, best sci-fi films I've ever seen. If it's not number one, then it's definitely number two. I'm just trying to think of other sci-fi films that I love, but yeah, it was one of the best sci-fi films I've ever seen. That is the first time I have wanted to watch a movie twice. I've never wanted to watch a film twice. When I end up watching the film again, it's usually years later. After watching Dune, so for yesterday, I said I, I'm gonna have to book another. I'm gonna have to book a ticket again to watch this movie. It was amazing. I, I've never. I've never, I was proven wrong. Honestly, this movie, I was proven wrong big time. And I understood what the hell people were talking about when they saying this was a freaking masterpiece. This was unbelievable. From the visuals to the fight scenes to the freaking, like, one of the, my favorite, like, I think the highlight moments for me was their slow motion scenes. Like, the slow motion moments in this film was so iconic and freaking chilling, especially from Paul. When Paul, bro, oh my God. When he was walking in between the Fremens, and when he was, um, I think, which scene was it? Obviously, when he was careful, walking towards careful about his... Spoilers. Careful right? about spoilers. Careful about spoilers. Oh, sorry, spoilers. Okay, no, no, no. That's not really a spoiler, yet. to be fair. So we're not in spoiler zone yet. We're not in spoiler zone yet, but thank you, Jose. But yeah, his slow motions, like the slow motion moments in this film, for me, was the highlight moments of the whole freaking film. Also, another thing that I loved about this was you see fragments of the protagonist turning into an antagonist, especially with... That's not even a spoiler. Is it a spoiler if I say who? With that point, I just say. Let's keep the details in the spoiler section. Okay, cool. But yeah, the, like when you see fragments of the protagonist turning into the antagonist, it's like, wow. Like, this was freaking great. Like, I honestly, bro, like when people like, you know, at the beginning of the cinema, right? You got, what's his name? Daniel Sutton, where he said, hey, something, um, everyone be quiet, phones off. Now yeah. something about escape from reality. That's what it felt like watching this film. It was like an escape from reality. I wanted to be in this movie. That's how freaking bad it was. I imagined my own Fremen army behind me or an army behind me. I was like, I'm bro. It, this movie was amazing. Like it was, I was so shocked because, yeah, I just, it was amazing. I was lost for words. I was like, I've never watched a, this film. Felt like a film that came out, you know, like in the 2000 eras or the 2010 era. Like it didn't feel like our generation, well, our century type of film. It really didn't. It felt like a film that, you know, that what you would have expected to see. 20 years ago or 10 years ago it was amazing the best i think this is probably the best sci-fi film i've ever seen i'm just trying to think of sci-fi films i've seen Hunger games isn't really sci-fi is it? it's more, mostly the survey I, I, i'd call that science fiction now. yeah yeah Hunger games is a science fiction it, it is damn um okay it's between hunger games and dune this is better than hunger games for me, I don't know. I like Hunger Games a lot. This is this is better. <laughs> for you guys, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about that. But for yeah. me, it's top two. It's Hunger Games and Dune. I don't know which one's first, but for me, I don't know. After, I'll think about that later. But yeah, sorry, that's my opinion. This was a freaking amazing, visually amazing. Like the the instrumentals that the you know the background music instrumentals that they were using was so fitting and 
like it was just emotionally evoking. Like honestly, bro, like you were watching this film and you were just glued to the freaking screen. It didn't feel like it was a two hour and forty seven minute film. It went quick, so quick. I'm like, yep. Definitely, like, that. I think I don't even want to say what Daniel said about this film being the film of the... So I'm going to let Daniel say that, but... Yeah. It's, All right, let me, let me go before Dan. Let me go. We'll, we'll say... Yeah. I'm, 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 I could talk for ages, but this movie, movie was... All right, I am here trying to contain my excitement for this movie. I've already seen it twice. This movie is phenomenal. This is a phenomenal movie. It's not perfect, and I have small gripes with it, but this Same. movie is... I can't believe what I watched. And you know when you're talking about coming out of the cinema and wanting to watch it again, I watched it Saturday, 11 a.m. I was ready to watch it Saturday, 3 p.m. I was ready to go <laughs> back into the cinema and watch that again. The visuals were outstanding. And, like, there's there's a moment in the third act, which we'll touch on in the spoiler section, my adrenaline went up and it did not come down for the rest I of the I think I know which one you're talking about. Literally, I felt bad for anyone that I spoke to after that because i could not talk about anything other than dune it was so good it was so mate i'm trying to contain my excitement here for the for this movie it was sensational like like just like even like just like even all of the performances and stuff like that was just like timothy chalamet took paul atreides to a whole other level from what he did in the in the first movie like he completely elevated his game in in this movie there's like so many top performances in in this like Stilgar in this movie was was fantastic he was great he was probably like if it wasn't for Timmy Fesh, um if it wasn't for Paul Atreides he would have been my favorite character in this movie he brought so, you know, so much kind of so much heart and so much laughs uh out of it as well I don't know this was just I can't wait to get to the spoiler section, but this was fucking wonderful, man. I swear to God, I'm trying to contain my excitement here. I, 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 I agree with you about about Stilgar. It's not often that like an like a, like a fundamentalist is sympathetic, mm-hmm. right? You are with him the entire time. Yeah, in, in, in his in his zeal and his and his uh, uh, like passion for for the for the cause, right? Yeah. Normally, that kind of what I'm just saying. Normally, that kind of character is kind of, if not outright the villain, at least non like unsympathetic. Mm-hmm. And he really, he really uh, sold what it must feel like to have that level of conviction and and euphoria. And belief, yeah. Even even in moments where there was like maybe like some wavering or whatever like that, and then it was reaffirmed, and he was just like so happy with it. It was just like yeah, so great, man. So many so many great moments in there. Uh, and like you touched on the fight scenes, my like the final fight scene, like seeing that twice. I can't wait to watch that again. I'm going to watch this movie again. <laughs> that final fight scene when everything just goes quiet and it's just like excellent hand-to-hand combat i was just yeah the the fact that they they didn't add background music that as well made it so much better it was just pure silence everyone was just watching i was like oh my god sorry sorry even even the line before the fight may thy knife chip and shatter i was like i'm so ready for this (laughs) oh god man and the way he said so so um oh sorry i haven't said spoiler no, but oh yeah, I want to say it. Sorry, sorry. Carry on. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna spoil the section. We're gonna spoil the section on, on certain details. But basically, I love this movie. This is the best sci-fi movie I have seen. Period. Period. This is like again, like you were talking about, like wanting to live in this world. Like I was like so immersed. Like you just want. Like honestly, this movie could have been four hours. That and that's one of my like literally mm-hmm. one of my gripes is that it probably needed a longer runtime to like flesh out some of the other stories that they didn't really spend too much time on. But you could have given me four or five hours of this and I would have happily sat there. Like this is a movie where I would take a director's cut. If like the director said, here's everything that we filmed, <laughs> you can just sit and watch it, I would I would lap it all up, honestly. So yeah, I loved it. Daniel? Danny G. Come back so, my heart. <laughs> I saw this movie twice in cinemas, Saturday and Monday. And I haven't done that since Lord of the Rings. I don't. I don't normally rewatch movies in cinemas. I would usually like, like Jonathan said, like hey, let some time pass, let let my memory cool off a little bit, so that it feels fresh again. This one, the minute I walked out of the first showing, I I was planning when to book the next one. Uh, it's that good. So for me, Dune Part Two is like the best bowl of soup you've ever eaten. It's mm. it's delicious. It comes in a nice in a nice presentation. It's made from the best ingredients by the best chefs with with passion and care. And then when you get to the bottom of it, there's a hair in it, and you don't care. 
<laughs> and that hair is the ending. I have some problems with the ending, and I think it's not just me being a book purist, and I'm not really that, but uh, it's not just about they did it differently and then in the books. It's act as actually a real mistake, at least one to two mistakes, depending on how you count, that really dragged on the ending. Everything was was pitch perfect. Like 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 you said that they it's two hours, it's almost three hours and it didn't feel like that. I was not bored at any point, even the second viewing. I fully expected the second viewing to drag and it didn't because now I knew where everything was going and what and I picked up on little details. It's 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 a it's as flawless as a movie gets. Um, and I think to the point where I think part one is a prologue and part two is the real movie. I still love part one though. Yeah, one. but but there, but it's clearly that yeah. part one was the practice round, and part two is the real is the real story. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, yeah. Can I carry on? Sorry, no, that, 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 that was about it. Uh, that's like, that's my overall impression. I, I was going to ask because again, you're the one, you know, you're the only one here that's read the books, yeah. and a lot of like talk that I've seen online is like either people love the adaptation of it or people like didn't like it because of how it was adapted do you feel like what we were given kind of like was it essentially a good ad adaptation did it like cover like the core themes of the book did it like you know portray the important messages because obviously there's going to be a lot of things that yeah. were cut out, of the, uh, cut out of the movie or sort of not brought sort of across from the book but do you like what's your opinions on that so I think it's important to judge movies on what they are, what they are, and what they are trying to be, as opposed to what you would like them to be. Right? Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of details, characters, subplots, events uh, from the books that were cut, and I would have liked to see them. But I think the main thing that's really contentious is how it downplays the geopolitics of spice, and the ecology of of Arrakis, and how that relates to the spice, and how that relates to the politics. Because to me, that is one of the most important. It's not more important than the um, Messiah story, but it is really, it's a really important pillar of the story. And that was um, not entirely removed, but mostly removed. So, and that brings me, so just before we get to that, um, one of the comparisons I, um, uh, that, that I came up with in thinking about this movie is, this is what Game of Thrones tried to do and failed. Because both A Song of Ice and Fire and uh, Dune are book, book series that are viewed as largely unfilmable because they are so complex and detailed and sophisticated and all the details matter so much that you cannot translate all of it to screen. No matter how many seasons you have, no matter how much how, how many movies you have, it, it just can't be done. And both of them took an aspect of the story and really leaned into that and cut everything else basically in the case of dune that's the messiah story about how do how um the the um artificial prophecy and and belief system that has been planted in fremen society informs them and informs their thinking and how paul slots into that archetype um largely against his will but kind of in kind of deliberately by him right and how he's conflicted about those two ideas existing in his head at the same time um, and in Game of Thrones, it was the War of the Five uh, Five Kings. Uh, so they are the feudal politicking and and the war and stuff like that, and everything else like the magic and the and the White Walkers and all of that was minimized. And uh, and one of the things that killed Game of Thrones for me was that they didn't do that properly, right? They didn't think it through about what needed to be cut and what needed to be changed, and and they cut things kind of half-heartedly where a lot of screen time was still spent on things that didn't matter given the new emphasis, and so you had things like, uh, you know, this is everything with brand storyline and, you know, Cersei just drinking wine on a balcony for two seasons, um, and that is basically what happens when you do, when you take this approach and it doesn't work because you, you don't think it through well enough, but Dune did it, co it, did it correctly and for, for the most part. Uh, Dune basically said, okay, we can't put all of this on screen, so we're going to tell a story about how a person becomes a messiah and about how um, about how that changes him and about this 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 whole this whole dynamic. And everything else was minimized, and I think everything they cut for the most part they cut for good reasons, and everything they changed they mostly changed for good reasons. Um, there's there's one thing I don't really like, just as a matter of taste. And one thing I really, but that really drags down the story. So the first thing that I don't really like is are we, sorry. Quickly, are we in the spoiler section now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've I guess I guess we're in spoilers now. So yes. 
one thing I don't particularly like is how they turn Shani into a warrior because she isn't that in the books. And and the reason for that is that um, it detracts from what is interesting about that character, which is that she is the only person who knows Paul the human and everybody knows Muad'Dib the prophet. And she loves one and hates the other. And those things exist in her head at the same time and that informs all her behavior and all the, all the books in which she appears. And that is really interesting to me. And they have this in the story, right? But um, by making her, first of all, by making her a warrior that kind of detracts from that and doesn't add very much in my opinion. And the ending where she runs away into exile, I think also detracts from that. So um, I have some theories on why they did this. I mean, we can talk about that later on, but I think that that was a mistake. I think it would have been a stronger story if they had this uh, configuration between Irulan, Chani and Paul and that tension within them and how that basically encapsulates the entire themes of the story if they had kept that intact until the very end. I think that would have been stronger. Do you feel that they're trying to set that up for the th for the third movie? Because I have that's... a theory about this. So yeah. Chani is, appears in this in the second book, dies at the end of the second book and her, her and Paul's children are the protagonists of the third book. What mm -hmm. I think Denis Villeneuve is doing is he's sabotaging the franchise so that so that he can make Messiah, the second book, and mm -hmm. then nobody else can make any any Dune after him. <laughs> That's my theory because that is the main effect of of removing Chani from the story, mm -hmm. right? And by put by, by having this irreconcilable rift between her and Paul. But did he not say in like one of his lines, especially like after he kind of drunk the juice and you know, kind of like had his you know, uh, vision you know, opened up, one of his lines was like, she'll come to understand eventually. So he sees like, possible visions. He yeah. also has a, uh, he sees possible futures. He yeah. also has a vision where he and Chani are overseeing a, ma a massacre and yeah. they both seem to be reluctant, but on board with it. Mm -hmm. Right, and that is not, not that that can't be harmonized with where Chani is at the end of the movie. Yeah. So that is that was a possible future that could have happened, but didn't. And there are other visions like this that are contradicted by something that happens later, and that was a possible future. Yeah. But I feel like as well, like some of some of his visions are not hundred percent accurate, but they do kind of like not come true but come true in a different type of like context for example for example like you know the battle scene where he in the first movie sees, sees himself but then in this movie is kind of portrayed as like charlie as like kind of like the person that is you know kind of replicating that scene from sort of the first movie so i feel like there is like still a possibility where she might still be there because I, I don't think they're going to cut Zendaya's character they're going to find a way to like in, include her in sort of the, the third movie where like she will be there and she will have to eventually kind of be by his side because otherwise she has, she's had no other purpose sort of, to the movie she needs to be sort of no, in Paul's sort of, kind of story essentially so the big thing I, is that what that that where they left her off at the end of the movie makes is incompatible with what happens next for that character in the books so yeah. what what in whatever capacity she appears it has to be completely different Mm -hmm. And it's hard to see how they go from here to having children together who will inherit the throne one day. And yeah. then you can't have <clears throat> the, the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's on purpose. I think that is that really is him saying, I don't want anybody else. I want Dune to end when I'm done with it. And I don't want any, anybody else to ruin it. Yeah. And he did that kind of he, like he basically sound like put like a put a bomb with a time with a one movie timer on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that anybody who picks up, up like when the, if, if this is as successful as we think it's going to be and Messiah comes out and it also does well, the studio will want to keep going, but he's done with it. So I, th I think this is, so on the one hand, he, he probably, like the, the Chinese character was probably made more important because uh, that was probably a condition by the actress would be my, 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 my guess. Okay, yeah. And also the way he, the, uh, he then did it was to preempt the story he doesn't want to adapt. That's the, but that's my that's my conspiracy theory. And if you watch this movie in 2030, you can tell me how wrong I am. Leave a leave a comment below. Um, and so that's the one thing where I like it's not wrong exactly. Like Villeneuve is is free to do this. I just don't see how it makes the story better. Um, and then the thing that actually harms the movie is is how the Holy War starts. And not only is it really rushed, where they go from winning a battle to going onto somebody else's spaceship and then flying off. Mm -hmm. within about five seconds but also um 
Paul's whole gambit is that he can hold the spies hostage, right? We are told several times throughout the movie that he who controls the spies controls the universe. And yeah. also that to control something is equal to the ability to destroy it, right? That is that is how he gets the emperor to, to come to Arrakis to talk. And that is how, that is why he wins in the end. Um, and but 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 then the the great houses just don't see it that way. They, as far as they are concerned, they call his bluff, and they they, they are right to call his bluff because he doesn't destroy the spies. He just sends out warships, which which could he could, which he could have done anyway. So, mm-hmm. so to me, the entire story works because of how central the spice is to everything. And if you control the spice, you can control everything else. And that is shown to to be not true in the in the in the in the, in the final scene. And that one, that one I have a problem with. That one actually undermines the story. I didn't pick that up, to be honest. I didn't pick that up. But... Is in the Holy War, chapter three. The Holy War kind of happens between book book one and two. So book two is kind of about the aftermath after the Holy War has happened. Well, what did the mom say when she was talking to her baby at the end? Did she say the Holy War, like, is the start the Holy War, essentially? Yeah, so 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 the idea is basically um, the the emperor has has surrendered and he's marrying Irulan to become emperor. So Paul is marrying Irulan to become emperor, and the other great houses refuse to accept his authority, and that is why the holy war happens. That is why the Fremen go out into into the rest of the universe and subjugate everybody who doesn't who doesn't submit. Right, that's what basically happens. But I have to agree. Yeah. Or, right, or, but it starts at the end of of of, of part two. Yeah. So how did that? Basically, they say more deep. We await your command, and he says, "Show them paradise." And then they go walk into the the the, the spaceships and just fly off. And mm-hmm. um, I think that that part. So, but that only happens. So that happens because the great houses don't accept his ultimatum, and they mm-hmm. don't. And because they don't accept the ultimatum, that shows that his whole plan of blackmailing the galaxy, because he controls the spies, is a, it does not work. It's not true. And that one I have a problem with. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Okay. And it didn't have to be this way, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, it could have very much been like the way it's supposed to happen is that the holy war happens because Paul is no longer in control of of the the, the more deep persona, mm-hmm. right? Like the with the fremen put in a position of of authority, become the oppressors that they previously fought against. That is the tragedy of the fremen. Mm-hmm. And this like this happens in about five seconds here. And I don't understand why they could have had like shown a few scenes of what happens over the next few weeks. And, you know, there, there are good and bad ways of doing this. My, my point is just um, saying that holding the spice hostage doesn't work because zero of the great houses uh, uh, surrender in that moment. Mm-hmm. That undermines the story and what it's supposed to be. Maybe. That is my, my one big my, my one big complaint about about the, the, the movie. Maybe it was played out like that because obviously the director's not going to be after part three is going yeah but but that's the whole like the reason he the reason the showdown happens is because he sends a message to the emperor saying i've got nukes pointed at the spies let's talk yeah and the most powerful person in the galaxy has to obey his command because he controls the spies that's the whole point. That's that's why this is all happening, and that is why Arrakis is important. And this is Paul's entire plan. And this is why he and the Fremen together were the only configuration that could have led to this outcome. And all of, like it all it all comes down to control of the spice. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like Arrakis is not just some planet. It's it's the only re- only place where the only resource that the entire like all of society. Like imagine if there was one country in the Middle East that had oil and nobody else in the world had oil. Mm-hmm. That's that's what this is. And somebody had a match in the hand and say, hey, I'm going to destroy all the oil fields unless you give me what I want. Mm. That's basically what's happening. Mm. And 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 but the events of the final scene undermine that completely. And it's it's not even a matter of it being an adaptation, because throughout the movie, they constantly tell us uh, to, to destroy a thing is to have power over it. Mm. Right. It's the first line, even before the opening sequence. Where we hear this, uh, you know, throat yeah. singing kind of thing that 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 says that, right? And that sentiment is repeated three or four times in the movie. It's made very clear. It's it's one of the things you're supposed to pick up. Mm-hmm. And then they don't do it. Then they do the opposite. And I don't know why. 
like with with Chani, I understand why they did it, right? Yeah. Like like this character, like the the way the book ended six years later, it's not like they they had to change it in order to be accepted by the by audiences, um, because Chani essentially becomes the emperor's concubine, as far as the history books are concerned, mm -hmm. and that was just not going to fly, right? That was not going to happen. So I understand why they did that. I don't understand why they changed why, why the why the blackmail um, scenario doesn't work because that is the exact opposite of what we should be happening in that, in any version of the story. I don't want to drag this whole thing down, but I, just, I thought I'd get my complaint out of the way. Because <laughs> I think I think that what, like everything else is taste, right? Like yeah. we can talk about other things that I also didn't love, <laughs> but this is the one that really really is a problem with the story. Well, for me. Um... Funny enough, I think the showdown was a problem for me. Wow. Now, don't get me, don't get me wrong. The, sh the fight scene in that was amazing, but I think more could have been at stake if the villain had a story. What I mean by that? Okay, there was a lot of antagonists in the film, right? But I'm talking about bold Elvis, the um, Paul's cousin. What's his name? Fade Rafa. Yes, him. He if with him. His story felt undercooked because he was just introduced to us as this evil guy, right? And he had a scene here and there where he showed his evilness. So it was like his fear factor level was growing, but it just felt undercooked. So then when it came to the actual showdown, it felt a bit underwhelming because it was like, we've seen Paul's story. So we've seen how Paul has kind of like transformed into this guy where, like I said, he's shown fragments of him turning into protagonist, especially after he drinks the poison. It was like when he woke up, I just might the mood just shifted. I was like, Oh, I, I can like feel something in this guy that's changed from the Paul that we've seen all along till this point. So with Paul, you know, it, a lot was at stake. I think, oh, but obviously with the, like I said, with the actual his cousin, um, I forgot his name again, Bold Elvis. With him, it was like, yeah, he's you know he's scary and he's you know he we've seen scenes where he's threatening. I'm not saying his story should have been long. But he felt like his story was missing. So that's why when it came to the actual showdown, it just didn't feel like much was at stake. If, you know what I'm saying? So, but the, sh the showdown was, like I said, it was unbelievable. Like the fight scene, the way that the music cut out and it was just like everyone was just in a quiet room and watching them fight. It was amazing. That was amazing. It just felt like, you know, it didn't feel as tense, it, as intense as I wanted it to feel like as if, like, you know, if, you know, it just didn't feel as intense because I just felt the story, the antagonist story was missing I feel that like was my problem I was I was gonna say uh I, I agree with you I feel, I feel like the way he was introduced in the movie was was done really well you can kind of see he's, he's a little bit of a sicko he's a little bit sort of kind of psychotic he's very sadistic you could you could just tell like even for the Harkonnens he's like a little bit more of an extreme version and obviously you have the scene where he makes uh his brother uh Robin I believe is, is his name he makes his brother like kiss his boot and stuff like that as well, and how like ruthless, ruthless he is when he like kills you know, the the woman servants that he had. But I, I I have to agree. Like they probably this is what I was saying at the like at the start of the review where they probably could have added another fifteen minutes, and I feel like audiences would have been on board with it where they like fleshed out a few of these characters which were kind of like a little bit undercooked. So even like the conflict between. Uh, Galen, I believe is his character, and Robin, where, you know, you have this, the line from Galen where he says, you know, he gave me this scar on my face, and he, I, I believe he says he's something, something about, like, him killing his family and stuff like that. With Gurney. With Gurney, sorry. Yeah, with Gurney. So, you have, you have that conflict, which is kind of, like, in the background, where they've, like, set up that there is some type of history behind it, but it's not really, like, fully fleshed out, and you don't really, like, to know, know too much about it. So, there are a few pockets of characters here and there where they probably could have done with just a few extra scenes. Like it, it didn't need to be sort of too much just to add a little bit of weight to the character. Cause like, yeah, I do agree with you. Like it does feel like, and, and like, I think, you know, Daniel, you were mentioning it uh, maybe in, in the previous video where, you know, Fade is meant to be like, kind of like the opposite to what Paul is. He's like, kind of like, you know, his, his foil essentially where he's meant to have sort of, you know, Kind of, he's you know trained by the Bene Gesserit as well. He's meant to have like sort of be seeing visions and stuff like that as well. He's meant to be like kind of like the anti sort of no, uh, the anti Paul. Um, he's not trained by the Bene Gesserit, but he he but is he, also the heir to a big house. He's also yeah. part of the um, Kvizat Hadarach um, yeah. breeding program. He yeah. was supposed to marry um, Litos and Jessica's daughter to produce the Kvizat Hadarach, I think. 
if it wasn't Raban. But like they're 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 part of the same system. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, so they're, they're part they're part of the same same system essentially. Um, and yeah, I I just I just feel like they pro- they they just probably could have done slightly more uh, yeah. with with this character. I liked it a lot better on the second watch because it's it's I I I, I thought the same thing as the two of you did the first time I watched it. And, I, and in the second one, I picked up a bunch of details. So Fade Ratha's arc, like he doesn't really have an arc, but the but his deal is kind of implied and communicated in individual lines. So um, the fact that, so for example, a really important one is when um, the, um, the Reverend Mother and Jessica have this psychic commun- communion where Jessica gloats to to her saying hey, you should have picked the, should have picked the, a different side and the reverend mother says you of all people should know that there are no sides in this yeah. meaning whoever wins the Bene Gesserit win mm-hmm. right either way they get somebody who is within an inch of being the Quisatzadrach on the throne yeah but how does that but how does that kind of like aid like how does it yeah, how does that aid his story, though? Because I think the thing that was missing was his the story. story. It's, not, it's not his story. The story is about the Bene Gesserit's plan. And the Bene Gesserit's plan is such that whoever wins the fight, they win. So yeah. they have been, not only is, is um, Fade Ratha part of the breeding program uh, and a result of it, uh, he's also being controlled by the Bene Gesserit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. through, through Lady Fenring. Um, and um, uh, he's also part of uh, uh, the Baron's plan for putting him on the throne, independently of that. Yeah. And so he is basically, he thinks he's the hero of his own story, but actually he's a pawn in at least two different people's plans mm-hmm. in a way that he doesn't even understand. Like that is, like that is his, his story. It's not yeah. a story about a hero, or it's not even a story about the of, of a villain. It's the story of somebody who think who is the villain, who thinks he's the hero, but actually he's a pawn in somebody else's scheme. That makes sense. And I, that's actually a good observation, and I actually can agree with you. But it still doesn't kind of like negate from what I was saying in terms about the stake, because I think is yeah. what like I'm saying for the sh- you know the showdown. The stake for me being so like it wasn't so low, but it wasn't as high as I wanted it to be because of the reason that he it's not personal between Fed Rather and Paul. Right, Fedrath is just a speed bump who has to. He, he's the end boss you have to win to get to the cutscene, but uh, the reason he is in that position is the plot. Mm-hmm. Like, like is 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 the is is the it's what it's what is what is what is uh, interesting and important about Fedrath. He himself is nobody. He's just some guy who is complete. Like, if he dies, some like they have other prospects as as. Um, the uh, Reverend Mother says at one point, right? Like if Fedratha fails, if Paul fails, oh, we have other options, mm-hmm. right? It's, that's not important. What's important is the bloodline. And the bloodline has already been continued through like, through the Bene Gesserit. Uh, and, the, 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 and, and the Bene Gesserit don't actually care who wins the fights. So this whole, like, that's kind of part of the joke of the whole story that no matter what, like this, this entire hero's journey is not only undermined by the complexities of uh, hero worship and uh, following a charismatic charismatic leader and all of that but it's also a farce because they are just all of that just happen is just a sideshow to the real plan that's happening in the background and the pieces don't even know that they're part of a game Mm -hmm. this is in in most cases paul probably does now but the certainly doesn't and that's the difference between them or one of the differences that makes it more interesting I, I think that makes it more interesting, like seeing it from that perspective and under, understanding him as a pawn above anything else. I mean, and I agree as a villain, he, like in, when I watched it for the first time, I thought he was the villain or, or, or approached him as the villain. And he's kind of uh, underwhelming as that, right? Like, yeah, OK, he, he, you know, he is crazy and he's hyper violent and brutal and all of that. But that's kind of it. But then I realized that he's not the villain, that Bene Gesserit are. And mm-hmm. he's just, you know, he's he's just you know, a weapon they're using. Yeah. And that's much more interesting, I think. And I'm, I'm really happy that the movie did this. They didn't have to. They, they could have could have simplified it a lot more. And that, that is one of the things that's carried, that's carried into the movie, and I'm really glad it did. Hmm. And that's, I think that's like, you made a very good point. I think with this film as well, it's like, it, it just feels like a puzzle. And we're actually seeing the puzzles 
like you know fall in place even though i didn't get the point that you said at first but now that you mentioned i was like oh crap okay it makes sense that this guy was just support i'm like okay that kind of you know changes what i'm feeling so it feels like as, I, as you're saying i think this movie is an actual puzzle and i've actually seen the pieces coming together now i was like well how many pieces would you say well quarter of the of the puzzle has been completed or half because this is going to be part three next is there how many like novels are there well like there's 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 kind of six novels that the that the original author wrote and, and how the, much um how much um of the movies did the how much of the novels did the movies cover the first book just the first yeah yeah but well, it, it, it's like you like the novels are weird like they get quite esoteric and they get kind of trippy uh and i kind of want them to keep going all the way because there's some really interesting ideas in there that are buried in some not so great books in my opinion but the the ideas are amazing um and part like part of me wants Venov to stop at messiah because that's what he wants to do and him spending the next 20 years adapting books he doesn't want to adapt doesn't seem like we would help anybody at the same time the doing giving this to somebody else has to make it worse kind of mm -hmm. so and I don't really trust, like, like if this turns into a big multi-billion dollar franchise, I, I don't trust the studios to take it, like that to, to make sure to, to keep, to maintain the quality control mm -hmm. um, that, that has been on display here. Um, so I'm conflicted about like in, in a perfect world, I would want adaptations of this quality level of all six books, mm -hmm. um, even if they're quite different and even if they have a very specific take on it. But, you know, if, if, you know, if we just get two books and a complete trilogy, uh, that tells one story and makes a point then i'm happy with that cool there's uh, any 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 positives because i feel like <laughs> oh, yeah, there are lots, like, the, the, like the the quite like the like the movie is i focus on the two percent right now that i that i didn't care for yeah everything else is wonderful wonderful like the the i, lo I love how alien it looks like I have, I have a couple of more complaints like i think the like the emperor is, is lame like he's just a senile old man who I don't believe has been holding on to power for over a hundred years and you know was behind the conspiracy in part one to destroy the Atreides. Like he needs to have basic basic principles of politics explained to him by his daughter at one point. It's ridiculous. But trying to portray him as like a pawn as well though. Because the way even he, the way he, the he is, he is, yeah, yeah. So he's not fully like he thinks he's fully in control, but he also isn't because there are like hidden forces and 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 so on. But just on a basic, just by basic level of doing his job, he's really underwhelming. Like, but I thought, sorry, um, like error. like at least every time I saw him, uh, every time he actually talks about about power and about politics and about ruling, he comes across as a complete idiot and amateur. Even, but that's I thought. Yeah. I no. thought they were trying to do that because he came across very fragile. I said to myself, okay, this guy's coming across, like I said, fragile. But at the same time, the way that the mother was, you know, talking to his daughter, what's his daughter's name again? The one that Paul takes yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was like, this guy is just there. He's like a pawn. So, it, it, yeah. so I think that was their intention. Yeah, you should think pressure. he's in charge. And yeah, you should like it. But he, he, there were times where he did seem like, where he did feel like he was in charge, the way that he, with certain lines, you know what I'm saying? So, but well, like, for, so just an example, right? There's the scene... Uh, I think they're in a garden or something, and he's talking to basically he's basically testing Irulan, right? Like, what would you do in this situation if you were Empress? And uh, it's not a case of he knows what the answer is and he t he's testing her. She gives the answer, and then when he disagrees, she corrects him. Like, yeah, it doesn't what... sound like the guy has ever you know spent a minute on statecraft whatsoever. But could this could this also be the complacency of? being in charge for so long because he's probably been emperor for so long you can see how like everyone's fallen in line for the most part all the that all the, some of the different you know, houses yeah. and you know, whatever where it's just like you know stuff like this doesn't really even happen on his watch anymore so he's kind of just you know a bit nonchalant was like kind of forgotten how to sort of yeah yeah, but it didn't really come across as somebody who used to be great and has become old or something. Yeah. He just seems like he shouldn't be there. Like, there's no, I don't understand why he's there. And like, why wasn't he overthrown 50 years ago? Yeah. You know what I mean? I agree. I agree. I, I, agree, to be fair. I agree. I just, I, I just think that his performance was, was conveying to us that he was never in control. And the person that was really in control the whole I mean, time. I mean, he had, like, he ha is, in fact, the most powerful individual 
Yeah. No, he was con- he was in control, but he wasn't in control. So, for example, you know how a lot of people say the president of the United States isn't really the most powerful person in life. Like he's he's yeah. just a puppet. Yeah, I, that's what I thought they were trying to do with obviously, you know. My man. Still have yeah, like- it, 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 it doesn't really impact the story all that much. It's more like would have been nicer if if he seemed competent and he's just being like I think the Ben Gesserit would be more impressive if he was really competent and ruthless, and they were still outsmarting him. Mm-hmm. Here it doesn't seem like an accomplishment to outsmart the emperor, mm-hmm. right? And and that kind of made me kind of sit through those scenes, and they weren't as compelling. Um, for example, um, question: I don't think it's necessary at all. Question: How do you guys? How did you guys feel about Paul's granddad? I forgot his name. I forgot. And listen, guys, one thing you need to know about me is I always forget character names. It doesn't matter how many times I watch the movie, I'll just forget. So. But I do remember the, the relations. You know, I do remember the relations. So how do you guys feel about um, how Paul's granddad came to his demise? Um, uh, um, I mean, didn't, it, didn't it feel underwhelming? I was going to say, it, it probably wasn't the most satisfying ending, ending but again... Not necessarily the ending. Sorry, let me clarify okay. my... But the way that he was presented in this film, because in the first film, he oh, was yeah. like... Authority, yeah. Been... So that was... That's probably what, one of my complaints in terms of, like, where I feel like the first movie probably did it a little bit better in terms of, like, the political scheming and, you know, the manipulation and stuff like that. I, I don't feel like he was probably given much to do in the movie but again it's, it's like something of what Daniel was saying earlier uh in the review is that you kind of have to approach the movie for what it's trying to tell as opposed to what you want it to be so as much as I enjoyed a lot of like the political games that were being played in the first movie and probably wanted to see a little bit more of that so you know when he's talking about putting his you know, nephew uh on the throne as the emperor and stuff like that wanting to try and actually understand what his plan was for that and like what you know how he was maybe even trying to go about that or even like them trying to like present some type of understanding as to how he was going to achieve that would have been you know interesting yeah but he he i don't know he just he just doesn't have much to work with and again this is where the movie could have been probably a little bit longer where they could have like fleshed out uh a little bit more of like what his plan was for like his nephew and for overthrowing the um the emperor because there is that that one thing where he tries to hold over like the emperor ways like you know like mentioning to the other great houses exactly what what happened in like the emperor's involvement in some no, the the de- demise of the Atreides family, but again, it's it's not it's not handled the best. But and, and again, I don't I don't want to be on the here complaining because I love this movie. But yeah, but it would be even better if if stuff like that was a little bit more fleshed out. Yeah. And, and, and generally, the the so first of all to answer your question, I think one one thing I really loved about that scene is how mythic. Paul appears. Yeah. No, he is like, feels like a legend. Yeah. Sorry, right? and he sorry, walks sorry. into the hallway and he just walks past. Now, in the first movie, a Sadokar showing up was a bad news. Here mm. there's like 20 of them and Paul ignores them and just tells his guys to arrest them. Right? So that that already is, is a different level. But yeah. the way he's fr- shot and framed and the way people look at him, it's like when he walks up the steps Kill, like kills the Baron and then looks at the Emperor. He he he's framed like somebody out of a fantasy epic or something, mm-hmm. right? He's not he's not a person at that point anymore. He is he is more deep. That scene was amazing. Sorry, I should I should have clarified what I meant. In terms, I mean like the how he was presented in this film. The that scene was amazing. I agree. Yeah. That, that, yeah. scene, even the way the, even before he killed him, said something about grandfather. Like with the line that he said to him is like, "What do you say again?" Something about he said. Nice, was it nice to see you, grandfather, or something like that? What do you say? Some, could... no, I, can't, I can't remember the line exactly. Sign with grandfather, and then the way he just stabbed him. That was amazing, especially like, you, the, like I said, the slow motion when he walks into that you, into that location. Was it die like an animal? Sorry? He, you die like an animal. Yeah, some, yeah, I think it was yeah. along those lines. Grandfather, yeah. you die like an animal. But just the insertion of grandfather, that was amazing. The way he just looks at him, so he doesn't even see his face. That was amazing. So I agree. I'm just, I just meant, I should have clarified, I meant in terms of how he was portrayed in this film in comparison to the first one. So yeah. that's why. That's Overall, what I, I think the Harkonnen are underwhelming because they, like, this is a universe in which statecraft and, and manipulating entire populations is down to a science. Right, I, I really enjoyed those scenes where Irulan talks with the uh, Reverend Mother, and they are be- like they they are talking like they are, I don't know, 
like working on a spreadsheet for procurement or something when they're actually talking about the faith of billions. You know what I mean? Like, you know what, what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so they basically like Irulan is a product of the Bene Gesserit and and she has fully internalized this way of thinking and of manipulating this big these big forces to bring certain events into motion and what factor will produce what effect and all of those things. That that was that was really interesting, and it's it's, it's this like that's one of the things that always has appealed to people about about Dune that this is a world in which that level of thinking is very sophisticated and very high level, and what was missing from the Harkonnen, in my opinion, was a theory of statecraft, because they're all about sadism and exploiting people and squeezing, right? Mm -hmm. But we never see that work, not really. Mm -hmm. Like we with the Atreides, we we, we they have this very cynical approach to benevolence right where they say, where they do positive things because ultimately it benefits them and then have a propaganda department to inform people why they should love them right it's a really messed up way of of being a benevolent dictator right but they, it's there's, there's a sophistication behind it and a theory and and a method and that is missing entirely from from the Hakonen. Mm. like there's no I, I don't see how being that cruel would work in the long run and why they are in power and why they think that's the right way to go and ruling with fear now sorry ruling with fear yeah but but um like it's not just fear like they it's like the number i lost track of how many of their sub subordinates they kill just because mm. right like don't they run out of people, people at some point mm. right uh, and you know it's not even just punishing failure like i understand that uh, but it's more like they don't. There doesn't seem to. It just seems to be random cruelty, as opposed to a plan. Or like this has worked for them for centuries, and this is what has kept them in power. And as 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 reprehensible as it is, you can see why somebody would pick that strategy. Like that was missing entirely. But every everybody else has it in the story, right? They the Atreides have it. The Bene Gesserit have it. The Fremen have it. Um, they all have a method to what they're doing and why they're doing it, and a track record to prove why it's a good idea. And the Harkonnen are the one exception. And there's a limit to how much of that is in the books as well, but that really stood out here because like all these scenes where they are de dealing with like losing spies, uh, like like missing their quotas and everything because of the sabotage from from the Fremen, there was just no idea of what they was like. We saw them being in charge, mm -hmm. but we didn't really see what that means. And that was a little bit underwhelming, especially since like at least four scenes where this happens. Um, and that would have been a bit, would, have, would have been nice. Oh, man. So so like, we've talked a lot about negatives for a movie that we all agree is wonderful, right? So what's your favorite scene? Oh, that's what the next question was going to be the highlights. Um, oh. Okay, who wants to go? Yeah. I want to go first. But who, I, I want to be go, go for it. I can I can I go? Yeah, go. you can go. You can go. I, I, th I think you've touched on the scene when he's like walking through the Fremen in this, this sort of the council where they've got like the elders where only sort of like the leaders are able to speak. But that scene was amazing! Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, it's right after he drinks the poison as well. Like, oh. it was just so, that scene just fits. Sorry, carry on. I'll, I'll no, go, go, go. When I was talking earlier in the review about where the adrenaline kicked in and it didn't drop from there, I swear to God, when he started speaking with conviction, I was like, okay, like we are here. He's arrived. Like it was just, you just, you just felt it. It was just like chilling. I don't know. It was just. But when he says, who here will challenge me and 10,000 people draw their knives? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, it, and literally doesn't, doesn't even like, Lynch at all. He just looks at the guy straight and tells him about his whole backstory and his grandma and this and the other. And he's like, I am the Messiah. I am the guy. I have arrived. And this is what we're doing. And it was just like brilliant. Another, another like, another like highlight because I didn't expect it was when he said to, when he said to Chani, as long as I'm breathing, I will always love you. And the fact that he, sorry, he'd said it twice in the movie. I think he said it like once when they were like, you know, sleeping with each other, whatever, like that they were in love, said it was cute. But the second time he said it, after they'd taken over the emperor, you just feel the chill behind it. You could just, you could just feel like- He was saying goodbye to her, right? Exactly, yeah. it made sense. It was like, at the end of the, oh, okay. That's why he said it the second time. Yeah, right. and you, you, you could literally feel that something's not right here and <laughs> in the very next scene he's like 
to the emperor without again without hesitation with the conviction of a true villain said to the emperor i will take your daughter's hand in marriage and didn't even look back didn't even flinch i was like like again because i didn't expect it you know with these movies falls in love with the feminine they go off live a happy life or whatever like that and she's like all on board or whatever like that but that gut punch was like damn i was like damn in the movie but yeah anyways you guys can go on about your highlights and you know what the reason why for me like if you guys don't know the speech that the feminine after drinking the poison when he's in that little tomb place the reason why that for me was amazing one of the best scenes i've ever seen in actually let me just keep it sci-fi in sci-fi in general i think the reason why that scene felt so much better was because i think with paul um the actor what's the actor's name sorry timothy chalamet i think what he executed so well in this movie was his transitioning in like um his like just his transitioning especially with his moods i remember the scene where he was having with his mother when um he shouted at her, i think because he she said when it was him the mother and the baby that were all having a conversation with her so with, with her, oh, her yeah. was an amazing okay. dumb, by the way. Tough. Yeah. and then he was like the your sister's asking why are you not why don't you want to accept who you are blah 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 and then there was a scene where he just out of the blue just like he because we've seen moments where he sh- like you know he rages but yeah. the way that he just does it it's just so unexpected and so it's just yeah it's just chilling because <laughs> he has such a calm demeanor and a very like loving demeanor which you soon see not fading away but turning into a like I said, he's slowly turning into an antagonist, especially the scene where I forgot where he sees um what was it? There's the the, mach- the machinery, you know the bombs where the guy um I don't know if it was a yeah, and he showed him like the missiles and stuff. Like the way he looked at the way he was looking at obviously the the firepower that he had. That's for me. That's why I felt like okay, the slight change is slowly being introduced. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think that scene as well, you know, the scene when you're sh- shouting at Fremen, the fact that, um, what's her name? Ch- Chani? Chani? Yeah. Even she stood up like she was going to do him something, like she wanted <laughs> to take out her blade. I was like, oh, no. That, just, yeah, the, just, that speech was, bro, the best speech I have ever seen. Like, I was reenacting that in my, own, in, my, in my head. I'm telling you, I was like, bro, the way everyone just pulled out their eyes. And he, oh my god, he, he was the step to me. I'm thinking, no, sorry, that was the best scene I've ever seen. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, that was the best scene in sci fi. And then one by one, they are won over, yeah, right, just because they realize, like, like, not only, like, not only does he refuse to follow, like, he openly defies them, right? He, he doesn't have standing, but Stilga begs him to kill him so that he has standing so that he can save them, right? Mm-hmm. And he just, just says, No, I'm beyond that now. Um, I make the rules now. Deal with and that it. shows the conflict as well, because obviously he wants him to kill him, but obviously that's when he's pretty much saying no, as well, you know, which is like his good side. But now <clears> he's, you know, claiming that power, which he says he doesn't really want. He just wants to, you know, be a part of the Fremen and, you know, what he's promised to Chani Zendaya, whatever that name is. But yeah, so it was like, okay, so now we're seeing that antagonist side as well as the protagonist side, which makes me so much excited because it's such a great setup for doing part three because it's like, okay, what are we going to see him? Oh, there's going to be conflict. I'm sure there's going to be conflict. Obviously, I haven't even read the novels, but I'm sure there's going to be conflict within himself. So I'm just like interested to see how his story plays out. For me, really, this like this is a movie with lots of great performances, right? And and Paul, I think, has this really. I was when going in, I was really a little bit concerned about how they were going to do that gradual uh, transition of him refusing the call to to accepting it to realizing he's he's lost control right so that entire arc is i think is done really really well but mm-hmm. one thing that really stood out to me was Gurney, because there is a sequence of shots with during the time where Gurney is with the fremen where the identities of lord atreides and muadib are merging mm-hmm. and at one point uh, Paul gives Gurney an order and Gurney says, yes, my lord. And he says it in the same inflection as the Fremen. Mm. Right. And at that point, it, it starts to it starts to merge. Right. And there's like three or four steps where they be, start out as two completely separate things to the point where they don't like each other and they have nothing in common. And the only thing they have in common is Paul. And, but slowly, one step at a time, they become the same thing. Mm. And then there's a scene in that council scene um, 
where Gurney becomes a convert and he realizes what's going on and he realizes that um, like, like he becomes a believer. And there's a shot where Gurney is in the background and Chani is in the foreground. And Chani looks at Gurney and Gurney has a religious moment. And then she looks back at the camera and she has just terror on her face. Because she realized that if somebody with an off-worlder like this, who doesn't, he was not one of us, who doesn't believe in our religion, if he converts, then it's over. Mm. Then I've lost. And then I, Paul is gone too, and he's become more deep. Mm. That is that is like, I had actual chills when I saw that scene, because it's it's very short, it's like one second, it's one look, there's no dialogue. Yeah. Um, and this is when Vil Villeneuve is on record saying movies, movies shouldn't have dialogue because it's lame. Um, and he, there, there's a bunch of these performances that are just facial expressions mm -hmm. and that are informed by what you know about these characters and what came before in the movie. And Gurney becoming a convert without even realizing it and Charney being terrified by it. That's that's wonderful. That was my like if I had to pick like one shot, that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Like forget the sandworms. This, this is like mm -hmm. Charney being afraid of of Gurney, like or what what of of or not of Gurney, but of the power of, of Paul. Mm -hmm. Over somebody like Yoni, it's wonderful. Mm. Yeah. That's one. That's one I missed. That's 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 one that I missed. Because like I, because like what what I what I thought was, do you know when like Paul puts on like his father's ring and like same, going, same deal. Yeah, it's it's like it, I'm the Messiah and I am like Lord Atreides. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. yeah. And like obviously you watched it twice, Daniel, in it, and I and I don't know whether I'm like picking up on the wrong things or whatever like that, but. It feels like in sort of a polar trade. Sorry, there's a fox outside my window. It's very distracting. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> if you've ever uh, heard, 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 heard a fox, uh, it's then they scream like small children. Yeah. And it's very distracting. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, if, it feels like they were kind of like setting up the, the sort of internal conflict of him, like from the very like start of the movie, essentially when, you know, there's, there's like dialogue where he's like to his mother, obviously like, you know, um, about like the believers and the non-believers and having to like if they're going to be able to like you know do anything they're going to have to like convert the non-believers like that's him identifying with like the Atreides side of him side of him and like wanting to like sort of exact revenge for his father and stuff like that and then obviously over time he starts to like kind of like you know find himself immersed in the feminine culture and stuff like that but then he's still slightly manipulating again like I think we I don't know if we touched on this in this review or like a different one where like he pretends to not know what Muad'Dib is or what Muad'Dib means, but he's like still like almost like manipulating the feminine to like be on his side to like kind of like welcome him and accept him into like their sort of you know, into their way of thinking. And I feel like ultimately he did probably want to be feminine and like eventually like, you know, falling in love with Chani and stuff like that, have that care and way of like that. But after seeing the Harkonnen bomb the siege and stuff like that, that hatred that he's probably still had towards them, he just like, was like okay i'm gonna just i'm gonna have to follow through with this like this vision that i'm seeing of me becoming the messiah in the holy war and stuff like that i'm gonna have to follow through because we're gonna have to destroy the harkening essentially i don't yeah. know if i'm like reading some of the like small things that they were putting in there wrong i know you're like super analytical in this stuff i had a slightly different read of that scene yeah. i think that scene where the siege is bombed and they have to go south mm. that's where he, he still he's still saying i can't go south you go without me you know yeah. come to retreat but that is kind of him being desperate and looking for any way out, right? That's a point where he still doesn't want to be the Messiah, but he realizes that one by one, all his options are being taken away. Yeah. Right. And that is the point where he realizes, okay, I, I, yeah. I, I like he, he doesn't, he doesn't go, like he, he doesn't accept this because he just has a change of heart. He, uh, he goes along with it because he realizes that he doesn't have any agency in history. Mm -hmm. Like that, that there are bigger forces at play that prevent him from choosing his own path, and that he has not like previously has been looking for any other alternative to to fulfilling the prophecy, and he's been he's been procrastinating essentially. Um, but that is the point where the like it was down to one option, which is stay in the north and and harass the Harkonnen until they leave, and that is taken away with the, the with the destruction of the siege because now they have to go south, and if they go south, he has to become. The messiah but then he then goes but then he goes willingly as well because he could have gone to the south and not become the messiah yeah because like, realize that there's only one way yeah like, at, at that point i might as well do it hmm. kind of thing like, he doesn't want to do it at that point he said he realizes he has to he has to and he has no choice hmm. and everything after that is somebody who realizes what well, i have to like 
this is something I have to do. Uh, otherwise, otherwise the alternative is to do nothing, and and that's the only possible way forward. Okay. Which I actually really liked because it, it's not like he just has a change of heart at some point in the movie because we're running out of like like the movie is at certain at a certain percentage of its runtime and now now he has to go south. It's actually like the movie systematically takes away his or his alternatives, mm -hmm. um, one by one, and that is the point where the last one was taken away, and at that point he realizes there's no other way. Which I think looks more interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh. Man, I don't know what else there is to say, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, the black, and, black and, say, huh? the black and the black and white scene on is it the Harkonnen planet? Mm -hmm. That like that looked amazing. That was visually stunning. That was yeah. like the fighters pit and stuff like that. It was just yeah, that was great. A little bit of foreshadowing here because that was on on sand as well. But it was artificial sand and completely controlled and not real. Mm -hmm. And then he gets sent into the real desert where he has no control. Mm -hmm. so it's just a little light, small detail that, that I really liked. Mm -hmm. like there's a, like a scene where he walks on sand and it's and everything about it is fake. Mm -hmm. But then we know that a couple of scenes later he will be in the real desert where or where he, he no longer has the ability to to create this this theater. Yeah. Um, where he can fight against people who have been drugged and given weapons that don't work and whatever else. Um, that was like that was a really neat little detail. Thank you for the key, Mike. I, I, I know what it's because I feel like if I say this, you are going to shoot me down, but should we get to the last words? <laughs> I, I, well, there's more to talk about, right? Like, can we talk about right. Jessica? Okay, yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah. This, this might be a little bit longer of a longer review than you. All right, cool, let's go. Look, we get these once a decade, okay? We can we can <laughs> go a bit long today. All right, cool. What you gonna say about Jessica? <laughs> I, I just loved everything about her. Like how is she's not actually a hero, but she she is kind of the villain mm. of the story. Mm. Like he like she's using um Paul as a tool, right? But mm. she does it because she loves him and she wants him to succeed. But mm. in order to do that, he has to become a pawn. Mm. And she does ruthless things in order to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like there's, there's, there's a lot going on there. I think the whole like the whole like her speaking to her the daughter baby. was like that was like very chilling. That was like super creepy yeah. as well. Like that was sorry. Did I did I take your point? No, it's fine. It's fine. No, it's... <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, just like. All, all of that was just like done really well and you kind of like we're just like creeped out by like the whole the whole thing of it as well and like it was like it just seemed like so sinister like what was what was going on and like all like the scheme that she was doing on like Paul it was just yeah and I thought that was also really well done because in the yeah. books there's a they spend two years at the CH and the daughter the sister is born during that time but she um is born with like with a fully formed intellect. So you have a like a three year old running around giving orders and talking like an adult, and mm -hmm. she's the one who kills the Baron in the end, mm -hmm. um, which never was going to work. And I thought this was one of those changes that really worked really well because she, yeah. like, there's this ominous presence, right? There's something like it's, it's almost like like the embodiment of foreshadowing kind of thing, right? Because we we kind of see what's coming once she is born, kind of, more or less, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's like very chilling as well, like when sort of no, Lady Jessica was speaking and you don't know whether it's her or whether it's the sort of no, the, the fetus inside her that's like, you know, speaking to Paul in the scenes as well, which is like, yeah. yeah. And, and she's, a character, like, she's a character we don't see, who don't have a voice, who doesn't have a personality, yet we know who she is. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about the mother that I loved. That I loved was her transitioning as well, especially when she did the whole scary voice. I was like, God damn, this is going to be scary. So you just don't know when it's going to come out, but it's coming. And when it comes about, out, it's and she uses it more and more throughout the story, right? Yeah, you can see it because she used it. A few she, times and, and, like, she also uses it at, at points where she doesn't have to. Exactly. So she, she's just she's in a hurry, and history is waiting, so she's going to use the voice to yeah. get the guy to go to obey. But this like, one, like like half a movie earlier, she wouldn't have done that. Exactly. So you felt the development in her character from turning into like you know protagonist to an antagonist. Like it's just it, bro, <laughs> the the makers behind this. This kind of falls into like it kind of falls into my last thoughts. But well, not in last thoughts yet. But I'm just gonna ask this as you know, uh, just a question. Forget the last thought thing. Okay. So the people behind this film, the directors leaving after the after the third part. Should 
what do you like because the vision like the vision that he had for this executed amazingly okay cool he had the novels to help him find but like you said you i think people said this film is a film that no one thought could be adapted and he executed that well so do, is after part three are we expecting it to go downhill should they stop after part three I'm really interested to see how part three goes over with the general audience because it's a very different kind of story. It's very basically a palace intrigue. Mm. Um, there's no big battles, there's no big actions. Like, there's some action, but not a lot. Um, and it, that's where, it start, where the story starts to get weird. Um, like the first book is very different from the books that come after it. So I, I kind of trust Villeneuve at this point to have a plan for 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 book two. Mm. And I don't. I, it's not like he's the only person in the entire industry who could do this, right? Like there's other competent uh, directors out there who, who could continue the story. And even if it's only half as good, it would still be really good, mm. right? But I'm a little bit afraid that they start turning this into a cash cow and they just keep running it into the ground and that will retroactively tarnish like the first couple of movies. Um, I Like I, I really, like, like I said earlier, I really would like them to adapt all six books and get all the way to the end. Um, of the main story, there's there's more books after that, but you know there's the six there's like six books that are kind of the main story. Um, but I don't trust anybody else to do it. It could very much go the way of Star Wars from the original trilogy to the sort of the prequel trilogy, um, and you kind you kind of hope that they can maybe do a little bit more of a removed story from some of the main sort of the main sort of Paul Atreides sort of like arc that they're doing at the moment, just because. Like, and I, I know there's so much more that we need to explore in the Dune universe, and I'm like so on board. Like, I'm very on board with getting a lot more out of this universe. I know, like, the main focus has been Arrakis and stuff like that, but then there's other houses, other families. It's like, it seems like there's other stories to tell, you know, whether it's, you know, book four, five, six, or like, you know, whether, you know, some a director or a writer can like look at the world of dune and pull a good story out of it or like set some like, hundreds of years in the future or like in the past or whatever like that i know we're getting the bene jesuits on the tv series that's coming out towards I was the end going of to say, yeah. pardon i was going to mention that yeah yeah so so we're getting that at the, at the end of the year so you know me personally as someone that's a convert and again like you know it's not like we're getting you know amazing sci-fi movies and sort of no excellent world building that sort of no that we get in doing so I would love for it to continue but again it's just can we trust can we trust Warner Brothers to not is it it's Warner Brothers that, that produces right is it Warner so. Brothers yeah can we can we trust them to not just you know start pumping out just doing related stuff for the sake of pumping out doing related stuff because everybody loves it I don't really trust them and even with the Ben and Jessica show I've, I've, I've I'm really skeptical of anybody being able to write those characters in a way that really does them justice mm. in terms of like all they are like you have to be you have to you have to do have really careful plotting and really sophisticated writing in order to really convey what these people are about um, and actually have them come across in ways that live up to that to that concept and so and it smells a bit like like a cash, like a Disney Plus show kind of thing, like in terms of what mentality went into it. And mm -hmm. I really hope they have a plan for that. And I really hope they they do something that lives up to that. Um, I just I'm just I'm just skeptical. If this if the show was coming from HBO, I'd have a lot more faith in it because HBO take the time with their TV series and generally tell you know good stories and like are very well thought out. Warner Brothers, <laughs> again, I don't I don't have too much faith. In, in it, it's it's more like the Ben and Jesuit are the kind of kinds of characters that work really well in one story that you've constructed to mm -hmm. work this way and to ha essentially have them appear from one every once in a while and say yeah. something ominous and and then the camera cuts away to somebody else. It's like if we have an entire show, like that whole <laughs> sequence with with Lady Fenring where she basically controls Fate Ratha, um yeah, like that is something you have to be very deliberate about about how you do this, and I don't know that any anybody can keep this up for ten episodes or whatever. Yeah, uh, even with the best intentions, even with a good plan, um, um, it's a bit like writing a conspiracy theory. You get you kind of have to construct it from start to finish and really plot it really intricately. 
otherwise it kind of falls apart and kind of becomes a parody of itself. And I really, really don't want that to be. Um, if I don't really want that to be to be that. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, what, what would you, I, I don't know when the fuck. But I don't think they release any statements or articles. He, he said he says he's 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 almost done with the script, but he wants to do something else first. Just kind of as a palate cleanser and then do it. So I would expect maybe four years. Okay. That's that's probably where we can expect part three. Okay. It's too long. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But I'd rather uh, he get it right and we get this tri- like a trilogy of movies out of it that sta- that stands the test of time and that holds together as a whole, as opposed to just hey this made money make make one more um, mm. thing. Um, yeah, and I will, and I'm happy. You know, I'd, I'd I'd like one next year, right? But I, I'd much rather have something that holds up, um, as opposed to something that comes out sooner and is forgettable because it doesn't live yeah. up to the standard. I'm really, this, I'm really this is set an almost impossible standard. Like we haven't even really talked. Like we've scratched, kind of scratched the surface. Like this movie just has, like the probably the most uh, disciplined writing I've seen in a long time in terms of every word and every line and every scene serves a purpose. And drives the story forward. There's no fat. There's no. Even though it's almost three hours long, um, it just it 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 feels like it feels very focused and feels very deliberate. Mm. And it feels like they cut uh, like the, like there's this saying in writing that you should kill your Daleks, right? Like that you should cut ideas if they don't belong, even no matter how good they are. Mm. Um, and Villeneuve really took a chainsaw to his darlings in this movie. Like I imagine, they're they like on like in the first drafts had much more stuff in it, and then he just cut stuff, like cut anything that didn't belong or that didn't further this core core story. Even though there are a bunch of things I would have liked to have seen, but the more I think about, like almost all of them, I kind of agree with, yeah, that would have only diluted the movie. And as it stands, it's just like a like a roller coaster that just doesn't stop for three hours. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I I agree. Like this, the script has felt it like it, it felt like something that I was missing. Like, like I said, we've seen so many Kaka movies for the past couple of years. Just it just felt so refreshing. Like this is what this is what happens when 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 smart people make movies and they have a plan. <laughs> yeah. This is why you have a script before you shoot. <laughs> so like like even like I mean I mean really like I, I I think almost all of the movies we've reviewed in the last three, three months could have worked if the story had been better mm-hmm. right that's very there's very few ideas that are irredeemable um and like this is really like this movie cost less uh, what was what was the disney plus show uh see, was it secret invasion secret invasion yeah yeah this was cheaper yeah. than secret invasion yeah insane this one think about that for a second <laughs> insane Crazy. for the visuals we got in this alone that's that's insane Crazy. yeah so it's it's um, just as a story and as an exercise in storytelling, it's 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 great. And I imagine, like like we've already dug up like little details and and like foreshadowing and setup and symbolism and all sorts of things that um, that are really subtle and really woven into the story, and you don't even notice they're there. Mm. Like you could write a, like a college paper about just the Harkonnen uh, arena and how it's symbolizing like like Fedrafa's arc. In relation to to Arrakis and like stuff like that, and there's just every detail is deliberate, and there's nothing in there that's like one one thing that really struck me was how short the action action scenes are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like they like uh, most of the fight scenes are just somebody walks up to somebody, three parries and stab, and it's over. Um, and the longest one is probably the attack on the Emperor's compound, right at the mm. very end. Yeah. And that's five minutes, maybe. Like the 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 attack itself yeah, is yeah, five minutes. Yeah, that that felt like it was over quite quickly as well, to be honest. Yeah, and but not like rushed. Like it didn't feel like oh, right. yeah. in a lesser movie. This would have been twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it would have been Avengers flying around, killing a bunch of useless people for no reason. Mm. Yeah, and it would, like I like I have this kind of thing often with with action scenes where they they start off interesting and then kind of get boring very quickly mm-hmm. because like you they've made their point yeah. and. It's interesting to have like an action director. We, I think, most of the movies he's made have been action movies. Who doesn't seem to like action? He he seems to think it's boring, <laughs> and I kind of agree with him. 
like like have, like the all the action scenes have like a, not only further the story, but they also are as long as they need to be to make their point, and mm. then it's over. Mm. Right, like like the the scene with with, with the harvester, right, where uh, okay. they shoot up, like there's this heli, this gunship ornithopter, yeah. and Shani with the bazooka and stuff like that. I think that was longer than the attack on on the emperor. That scene, that sorry, that scene was one of my favorites as well. I forgot to even yeah. mention that one, but yeah, sorry, carry on. Sorry, I was just going like like it's it's like there's only a couple of them and they are as long as they need to be and not one second longer mm. and that, that was really refreshing where there's no 20 minute cgi spectacle yeah. um that just goes on and on forever and and just repeats itself several times and could have been three times shorter um that was really and, and because of that they have more impact mm. like every scene has its own character mm. um like that scene at the very beginning with the Harkonnen troops being ambushed by the Fremen, where they kind of have mm -hmm. their anti-gravity suits and they go up the cliff and then they all exposed ground and they just get to get shot down and uh, Paul and Jessica are at the at the base of, of the cliffs and just every t every five seconds a Harkonnen drops. Uh, yeah, 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 that was, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, that was in the beginning, so I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> so, yeah. And that was the first scene, right? Yeah. And that's, I think that was the only time where the Hakonans were threatening, but they really were threatening in that situation. Mm. Yeah. That whole scene was like, it just felt unreal as well. It's like, as soon as they started floating up to the rocks, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm here. I was like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm present. This is like, just so wonderfully shot, but. Yeah. And the, <clears throat> and the simplicity of their surprise attacks when they're hiding in the sand, felt very, like I said, very simple, but it was just, it just felt like it didn't feel simple but it was simple like they're hiding in the sun and they just pop up it was just it just felt it was like what the hell is this amazing oh man this movie was great it was uh, the best experience it's watch it. is a it's like, it, 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 honestly the best movie i've seen in years yeah um, i'm really glad that it's getting the kind of attention it really deserves mm. yeah. i've been converted i've been converted definitely i want to watch part one again okay. i want to watch part Me. two this weekend hopefully yeah, I was going to say, you probably need to rewatch part one, I was going to say yeah. that, just so you can kind of get the full story. And I'd, I'd actually love to do a full marathon of, like, part one and part two. Just mm. like, I feel like reading the novels now as well. Um, yeah. Just to, just to see. Um, what's, which one's the last one you said? The sixth one? Six one is, the, the sixth one is called Emperor of Dune. And does it have a resolution or...? Uh, yeah. So that is, so kind, so kind of, it's basically the last one that the author wrote. Okay. And there were plans for more, but uh, basically that's where that's where kind of you could you could call that the main story or the end of the main story. Okay, cool, cool. Hi. Um, yeah. Well, guys, is it safe for me to say last words, or does anyone have anything else? I mean, I, I could go for another few hours, but I think we've made a point. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, so we haven't uh, talked about how Jessica's um, robes start be, start looking more and more like a Bene Gesserit outfit. Mm. Yeah. To the point where she just looks like one at the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like yeah, that, that yeah. was that was that was great. Mm -hmm. um, her descent into uh, into vil into kind of villainy is, is wonderful. Mm. Um, yeah, hundred percent. Hmm? No, I say hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, what what else? Um, yeah, I mean, we started off talking about the the weak parts, and I think there are a few. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, like the, like when I've really said, okay, this is the story I want to tell. I'm going to cut everything that is not related to that, and I'm going to make sure that this works and it does work. Mm -hmm. um, I just wish they hadn't undermined this the whole black spoiling the spice hostage thing in the end. Yeah. Everything else is is great. It's 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 probably like I genuinely think it might be the best movie, one of the best movies I've seen at all or, or like in anything just because it's that focused and that polished and like it has no dead moments it has no uh it has no bloat it had like it tells a very complex and out there and esoteric story in a way i thought that really made sense and and like um really really brought its key concepts across and the things that are really important are hammered home over and over again um and yeah, it's 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 like he, like Villeneuve set out to do something and he accomplished it, mm -hmm. and he gets all the credit. 
What would you rate him? Disagree. What would you rate, Daniel? What would you rate the film? I give it a Kvisa Tzadarach out of Ashai Hulut. And Churigan? What's going on? What the hell did you just say, bro? At least translate for people. Do I need to say anymore? I cool for my German fans out there. Well, for our German supporters, viewers out there. Jump in the comment, what the hell he just said. <laughs> well, okay. Um, do you have anything else you got to add, Daniel, or should we go to Hervey? Oh, I think I've set my piece. <laughs> Hervey, last four is their rating. This is as near a perfect movie as you can probably make, to be honest. Like, literally everything about it was wonderful like i like genuinely i've never well i was gonna say i've never but it's been a very long time since i felt such excitement coming out of the cinema after watching a movie like just literally like the performances were fantastic just like the story behind it was exciting the world building just like i don't know man please like transport me to dune right now i would i would love to live there man that is such it's such a it's just I'm a believer. I can't believe, like, I can't believe I'm saying it. Like, I'm actually like now a bit of a fanboy of like the Dune universe. Like, it's crazy. Like, I'm, I'm a convert. I'm a believer. I'm definitely gonna get the books. I'm definitely gonna check that out as well. Um, yeah. Now this is a ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. This is a ten out of ten. Oh crap! Wow. This is this wow. is a 10, out of ten. Okay. It doesn't well, need perfect to be ten out of ten. It's it's a ten out of ten. Okay. Um. Well. Um. For me. I don't have much to say besides I have been converted. Um, I agree with and I finally understand what the hype was about. And I think this is a film which will be universally loved. Um, I just, I just, yeah, it's it. Like Daniel and Hervé were saying, this is definitely, it might be, because I didn't want to say it was the best film I've ever seen because there's different genres and there's different movies that I've liked and obviously they all give you different feelings and you just different things that you like about them but this one if I did do like you know my favorite movies of all time it would be top three I just don't know where on that top three would be but yeah I, I just didn't know I would experience one of my favorite movies of all time <laughs> you know in my 20s honestly i thought maybe because the way that the just film was going the route that was going it was just it wasn't looking good honestly you know what i'm saying and obviously the movies i used to watch back in the day i can't fully remember it because i was you know i was young in it so i'm like what 27 now so the good good movies came out like i said 2010 era the whole before that so yeah i'm just yeah i just i didn't think a film like this would come out during my 20s probably 30s 40s maybe but yeah um i've definitely been converted and this I have, to, I have to have a deep think, but this is definitely top three or top two, top three movies of all time, any genre, every genre. This is definitely top three. I just don't know what on that list. Um, I'm giving this a 9.5. I don't like to do decimals. And the reason why I don't want to say this is a 10 is because of my dislikes. It wouldn't really make sense for me to give it a perfect score because even though like the this the dislikes doesn't outweigh nothing it's just like a fragment of disappointment that's all but still for it to be a 10 for me everything has to be perfect and that's just the only thing for me that I was lacking even though Daniel did mention the point that he mentioned which I do agree with like okay that opened my eyes a bit still I just think you know yeah I'll give it a 9.5 9.5 maybe if I watch it a second time maybe if I watch it doing part one and then I watch doing two again Maybe things will change. Obviously, after today's discussion, you know, I'll spot more nuances and that might go up. But for now, I'll give it a 9.5 out of 10. Top three movie film of all time. This shows, this just shows what you can produce when you actually put in like some love and care into the work that you're providing. And you're not just shitting out movies for the sake <laughs> of needing to like send something to the box office. Again, this is like, there was a story here that, you know, Danny Villeneuve wanted to tell. Like that, like Daniel mentioned, like he's picked out the key themes or the key story he wants to tell from the books, and he's executed it masterfully. And then everyone that's worked in this film, from like you know, the set designers, costume de designers, like everyone that's like added a little piece here and there to make this movie perfect, has just done a phenomenal job. And this is this is what happens when you take care. And mm -hmm. it and I again, I hope it reaps the rewards. I hope it hits the billion dollar club. Like this is. Like I, I hope it gets all the awards as well because mm -hmm. we need more movies like this. This needs to be rewarded. Like this needs to be, you know, yeah, this needs to be rewarded for what it is essentially. Yeah, hundred percent. 
All right, guys. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed this discussion because I know I have, and I'm pretty sure the other two have, especially Daniel. He's been, this is the most you'll see Daniel smile <laughs> in this journey. I'm telling you, it's the most that you'll see him smile. Well, um, yeah, guys. I was, I, was, right? I was worried. I was worried. Because because of the comments I saw online about people not liking the adaptation, I was worried because I know Daniel had question marks of how but they. If you're a real, real purist, then you're gonna be, you're gonna have stuff to complain about. Yeah. Um, and but for me, it's more along the lines of things I would have liked to have seen. Mm. I really, really, really would have like look up like the Guild Navigators just from other versions. Just go on, go on Google Image and look up Dune Guild Navigator, mm. and then imagine what Villeneuve would have like Villeneuve's version would have looked like. For example, but at the same time, if I have to think, okay, what do I cut in this movie to make room for, for 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 a guild scene? Like and there could there could have been. Let's not go into the details, but point is, uh, almost all of the things that that people complain about about what's missing, what's been cut, almost all of it, I kind of at some point have to agree. Yeah, it was probably a good, a good idea, and we've gotten about the points where where I think otherwise. Cool. Well, yeah. Um, guys, hopefully you um, enjoyed today's discussion. Um, next week, what will we be reacting to, guys? Imaginary. Um, um, horror movie about an imaginary friend oh. who's not imaginary and not a friend. Okay, cool. <laughs> Very good, good description. Well, hi, guys. Um, make sure you're on the lookout for that. Um, Herve, please, the plug-in. If you love doing as much as we do, please like, share, and subscribe. If you're a book purist and you hated everything that Danny Villeneuve did, also like share and subscribe <laughs> all right guys well hey yeah, guys thank you um we'll catch you next week and yeah au revoir bye bye Ciao.